OK, did you hear that, Ken? No, I didn't. OK. So I'm going to press. OK, we're good to go. Uh, good evening and welcome to Guelph Museum's military lecture series. My name is Ken Irvin. I'm the education coordinator at Guelph Museums, and I'd like to thank the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada for their partnership in this series. Uh, tonight, we're very pleased to have Dr. Jeff Bird give his presentation, The Torch Be Yours to Hold It High, Heritage, Meaning and Remembering Well in the 21st Century. The talk's going to be about 40 minutes uh, with time at the end for questions. Uh, if you want to ask, ask a question, just go to the Q&A function uh, and uh, it's the, like a little speech bubble at the top. And uh, hit ask a question and just type in your name or post as anonymous. Uh, if you have any problems viewing tonight's presentation, uh, it will be um, recorded and you can watch it at a later date on the, the museum's social media platforms. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that Guelph is situated on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabek peoples, specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Uh, today, Guelph is home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Guelph Museums commits to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to actions. We must do more to learn, share and support truth and healing. Guelph Museums continues to build our knowledge and relationships about the land, its history and its peoples. Uh, this commitment informs all that we do at Guelph Museums. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Dr. Jeff Bird is a professor in the School of Communication and Culture at Royal Roads University in Victoria, BC. Uh, Jeff created the War Heritage Research Initiative in 2015 and has produced over 30 short documentary films exploring Canada's heritage from the World Wars. His doctoral research focused on the battlefields of Normandy and the role played by tourism in remembrance. Jeff has consulted for the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and Education First Tours in their design of the Vimy 100 Education Expo in Arras, France. Uh, prior to teaching at uh, Royal, Royal Roads University, uh, Je Jeff's career involved serving as the Naval Reserve Officer. He worked with the provincial government in the field of post-secondary education and led a community development project in Vietnam while at Capilano University. He also worked as a heritage interpreter at the Canadian National Memorial at Vimy Ridge. Possibly his most significant experience was volunteering at McCray House while he attended the University of Guelph. Uh, he has lived and worked in Southeast Asia, Africa, Europe, and across Canada, and now calls Victoria home. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you back to Guelph, Jeff. So oh, thanks again for, for joining us. Great. Well, thank you very much, Ken, and uh, and thank you, Val uh, Harrison, for having me uh, join you this evening. And uh, I realize it is an Easter long weekend. It's a Friday night, even though it's a Thursday, so people are probably enjoying a relaxing evening, and I'm 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 happy to be with you to uh, share some ideas over the next 40 minutes. Um, I too would like to acknowledge uh, the ancestral lands of the Lekwungen and Kwisamsum peoples here uh, in what is known as uh, Kamosak or Victoria, as uh, we call it. Uh, here's a nice little photograph of the camas bulbs, the purple. Uh, flower that's coming up is uh, a staple diet, and that's the camas flower that was uh, resulted in the name of Camosun or Camosac, which was the original indigenous name for Victoria. So, uh, and of course, uh, just around the corner from where I live is is uh, this kind of view. So, I'm well and truly on the west coast here of Canada, and uh, it's just four o'clock here, and uh, enjoying uh, enjoying the. Um, the end of a, a very interesting week. Um, and uh, so here is what we're going to cover this evening. Um, we're going to talk about uh, this idea of remembrance, something that we uh, we talk about a lot and uh, and yet perhaps we need to think about it in a new way. And I'm going to suggest this idea of remembering well and talk about what that means and how we could go about do it, doing that. Uh, we're going to talk about the relationship between war remembrance and heritage as well. Um, there may be some of you that are interested in travel to battlefields overseas or to going to local museums, uh, to go to war memorials. Uh, so those would be tangible forms of heritage. And then intangible would be the commemorations and rituals we engage in around Remembrance Day as an example. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And I always like to give the conclusion first. Here's a photograph of uh, near Utah Beach. Um, I will 
be focusing mostly on Canadian sites, but we'll venture into a few other areas of the world uh, and and uh, to help illustrate some points. But uh, here's the conclusion. Remembering well involves connecting the past with the present. It's about uh, the opportunity to um, take responsibility and contribute to today's world and all its challenges that we're facing today. And I can start with connecting people to war heritage and the stories uh, the war heritage tells. So I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. And it's good that we start with uh, a photograph of, uh, of Vimy. And uh, this is certainly a place that's uh, dear to the hearts of many Canadians. And uh, this is from the uh, 2007 uh, commemoration, in fact, the 90th commemoration. And uh, but long ago in 1990, I was a guide at Vimy. And this was just after uh, um, working at McRae House when I was a student at University of Guelph studying international development. And uh, and it's interesting because that was so long ago, 32 years ago, uh, when I was uh, when I was finishing up at Guelph and uh, found myself on a, on a plane to work as a guide one summer at Vimy. It was the summer of Meech Lake, so it was really quite an interesting time to be there uh, when uh, we were talking about the birth of the nation and also a time of such great change in, in the country. Um, and we'd often reflect on that, you know, when we were there as guides, uh, the person beside me to my right, Natalie, uh, was from Quebec, and we would have a lot of heated discussions about the future of Canada while we while we also stood proudly as uh, guides at Vimy. Um, as was mentioned uh, by Ken, I did spend some time in the Naval Reserve, about eight years, which allowed me to visit the uh, both coasts. I worked at Star down in Hamilton and uh, Montcalm in Quebec City. So uh, I, it really allowed me a chance to, uh, to serve the country in a different way. And also to visit many uh, places, as I mentioned, one of which uh, comes to mind is um, spots like Bella Bella on the coast where, you know, um, as a, a federal ship coming into these uh, places, um, which are very strong indigenous communities, it was always a, it was an awakening for me to see all the different aspects of, uh, of Canada uh, in those days. Uh, I did spend some time in Vietnam and this particular photograph I like is, is because it's a, a group of students I was working with, Vietnamese students, Behind them is the undercarriage of a uh, B-52 uh, from the Hanoi bombings in the early 70s. And uh, I always found myself really quite intrigued by war history. And, uh, and so it always seemed to weave throughout my life from Vimy uh, through to my studies at the PhD level. I'm here at Royal Roads University, which was a formerly a, um, a naval college in the Second World War and then became a, a, a tri-service military college. Uh, and then I found myself working at places like this, uh, what could be a beach anywhere and what is actually a very powerful place, a site of memory, I call it, and a common term that Jay Winter uh, use, uh, uses and, um, and a term that Pierre Nora coined. And so as a site of memory, it's a place that holds meaning once we know the story. So uh, it's Omaha Beach. Uh, once we place that name on the sand, stories come to life and it becomes a very powerful place for people. So I've done a lot of work uh, over the past uh, seven years or so on a project called War Heritage Research Initiative. My doctorate was on looking at landscapes of war and, or sites of memory in Normandy and the experience people have there, as well as how those sites are managed. So I was always really, and I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about War Heritage Research Initiative a little later on, um, and uh, but um, I thought what I would do right now is actually just to give you a taste of the kind of work that I do before I go any further. Uh, so I'm just going to show you a quick video, and this is a project that ties with um, uh, Guelph and the McRae uh, story, but it's a project called Ways We Remember War. And it's basically to explore uh, 
art, literature, memorials, and pilgrimage, and how we use those to uh, to remember uh, to this day. So here's the video. Canadians gather each year to remember the sacrifice of servicemen and women in wartime. Communities commemorate with rituals, symbols, and stories, a powerful reflection of the impact of war on the lives of people and the nation. What shapes Canadian war memory? Where does it come from? And how does it evolve? 5,000 kilometers away from Canada's shores, this place continues to influence the nation and its people. Some 14,000 Canadians died here. Well over 50% have no known grave. These are Flanders Fields. This film examines Canada's baptism of fire in the First World War to explore the impact of its history and mythology on art, memorials, ritual, and pilgrimage. We saw something strange rolling over the ground yellowish, brownish, dirty in color, rolling forward with the wind. The story of commemoration is the story of the rights of these men to be remembered. We need to know about war, but I think what we should not do is glorify it. Bend your body to the will of the machine. Bend your body to the will of the machine. Your... The Canadian stand at the Second Battle of Ypres has become mythologized over time. In the early 1920s, many Canadians talked about Ypres the way they talk about Vimy. That it was at Ypres, our trial by fire, where a new Canada was born. timeless. It's just as meaningful now as it was when it was written in May of 1915. It was the starting line of the, the gas attack on the 22nd of April 1915. But this shows people and their emotions, their reactions to the horrors, the confusion of war. The very famous picture of the, the Canadians fighting at Kitchener's Wood. We were standing on that ground a hundred years to the day, remembering our fallen. How do the history and mythology of this particular battle both haunt and shape the ways we remember war through art, memorials, ritual, and pilgrimage? These are some of the ideas examined in the feature-length documentary, Ways We Remember War. So that just gives you a, a quick sense of the kind of work that I'm uh, involved with at the moment. Uh, ways we remember that it uh, focuses on the Second Battle of Ypres of 1915, which is, of course, uh, central to the whole McRae story. But we certainly go beyond that and uh, talk about a whole bunch of other links. We're in post-production right now. It's going to be about a 90 minute film, hoping to uh, just gather a little bit more funding to get us across the finish line. And then that will be available for public viewing. And uh, we try to do these as, uh, as educational initiatives. Um, so that's the kind of work that I'm presently doing with the War Heritage Research Initiative. Um, so let's just go back to Omaha Beach for a second, which is uh, uh, a very powerful place, a site of memory for Americans. And I'm always fascinated by uh, when people do this kind of thing. If we were to be coming from Mars and step onto this beach and see someone taking a photo of the sand, we'd be wondering, what are they doing? And uh, and so, of course, what, what he's engaged in, this young man, who turns out to be an American, is he's actually... Uh, connecting with a heritage, an American heritage. Um, 
perhaps he saw these kinds of photos, uh, the Robert Kappa photos of Omaha Beach of 6th of June 1944 in his textbook, or perhaps at the Smithsonian where they, they hang. Um, perhaps he's seen the movie Saving Private Ryan, which would have given him some of the ideas of, of the violence that occurred on that beach uh, that fateful day and on the other beaches, the other, uh, the other four beaches, uh, five altogether. Um, so, um, and that was, you know, that's, that's what that person is doing. He's, he's viewing uh, this place as this sacred site. And this would be uh, occurring day after day after day when I was doing my research there. Uh, about 1.5 million visitors come to uh, the Normandy American Cemetery, which is just on the hill here, uh, to uh, just at the top of the hill, and uh, to the Omaha Beach itself. So about 3.5 million visitors go to uh, the Normandy beaches as a whole annually, you know, pre-COVID. And uh, so we can expect that number to return. It's probably the most visited um, battlefield uh, in the world. So what draws people there? Well, you know, we've I've mentioned these photographs that would be building in this uh, American's mind. Maybe he has family that were involved with the battle. But just to, and we won't do a lot of this tonight, but I just wanted to share this whole idea of, of co-constructing meaning. Meaning is in the title of this film, uh, sorry, this film, uh, in the title of this presentation tonight. So um, we just need to just to think about these ideas. Um, so imagine uh, we are working with things like uh, a battlefield, the landscape, monuments, perhaps there's heritage buildings in the site, there might be memorials, there could be material artifacts, human stories, human interest stories that we're telling at these sites. Uh, we could smell the sea air, we could touch the sand, we, we may uh, engage with this place in some tactile way. And we are experiencing these places through our visitor lens, right? Our, our prior experiences, our own um, personal history, our national identity, these kinds of things. And this, this kind of connection is mediated through how we manage sites, the objects we present, how we represent this history. We talk about co-constructing meaning. So it's not like we can just present one thing and everyone has this, draws the same meaning from it. And I'm going to illustrate this as we go along. But um, so I just wanted to share a little bit about my lens. I've, I've touched on, um, you know, my some of the jobs I've done. But like everyone in the room tonight, I'm sure you've all had your own personal experiences through your family that connect you to some part of history. And in this case, I'll touch just briefly to illustrate a point on the experience of my um, of my uh, great uh, uncle, uh, Dan Costley. He was in the service in when he was 16 years old. He um, was let in when he was uh, encouraged to lie about his age. And the um, there was a narrative that went along with the story. Anytime someone spoke of Uncle Dan and they said, uh, go outside, go around the block, and come back in and tell us you're 18. And that was what we all knew as part of this family uh, story. And of course, uh, he was um, he was taken off to war. He was in the Middlesex Regiment. Uh, there he is, the blue circle around him. Uh, and then um, in my mind as a young boy, when I was hearing these stories from my grandmother, his his sister, it was always black and white. You know, it was always uh, trenches and gas masks, and uh, it was a very difficult story. And this is what we had of him. Of uh, Sadly, he died uh, in October of 1916 in the Battle of the Somme. This is his last letter, and uh, this is the, um, the coin, uh, as sometimes referred to, um, that was uh, a memorial plaque that was sent to the, the home. And uh, we, I still have it in my home. It was passed on to me. Um, and uh, so I now hold that. And that's my connection to the past. So I go overseas. I want to experience. I want to try to understand uh, Dan. Like many of us do, we might make a pilgrimage to an open field. 
in a, another beautiful farmer's field in northern France. And there's no markers uh, to uh, Danny. Um, there's uh, these markers like a, a soldier of the Great War. And I feel a connection to this. It's the date um, that matches his date of death. It might be Dan. I don't know. His name is part of the massive um, object, which is the uh, Tiatval Memorial. And of course, when we look at Tiatval Memorial, it's a memorial to the missing, and it's a powerful place with over 70,000 names, most of which are from the Psalm 1916 experience. And there's his name up on the wall there. And for me, you know, when I go and I have a chance, I like to visit him. I like to, that's as close as we're, I'm going to get to him. But in the idea of the time and space, um, I can't go back in time, but I can go to the space where he once was and I can feel close to him. So I've tried to walk through a bit of a story that involved um, a few different elements. And this is what, you know, when I said about co-constructing meaning, um, I told you a little bit about Battle of the Somme and the images, the, you know, historical images, but the, the story is mostly personal. It's, it involves a letter, it involves my mother, my grandmother, it involves a place, and all that shapes my heritage as, um, as Jeff. And, um, it's uh, it's something that we all experience when we think about uh, these wars. So I'm just going to touch on um, a little bit of uh, theory for just one second because it just helps us understand how heritage works. Okay, and um, heritage is of course part of culture. Clifford Gertz back in 1973 uh, provided this this famous quote on culture that many of us use to this day. And he spoke to it as uh, that culture was a system of inherited conceptions expressed in symbolic forms. So it could be a cross, it could be a maple leaf. These are symbols by means of which men communicate, perpetuate and develop their knowledge about and attitudes toward life. You know, this is 1973. Uh, hence the reference to men only, but of course we're talking about all, all genders. Um, so uh, this is a very powerful symbol that you find in these sites of war memory, a gravestone, a Commonwealth war grave. And we have, as I mentioned, we have a maple leaf, we have the cross, and then we read where he's, uh, where he's from, Duke of York's Royal Canadian Hazards. So this is an Ontario based regiment. And um, we can uh, we can kind of situate them geographically. Uh, we see that it was in uh, the summer of uh, 1944, so it was the Battle of Normandy just after the you know June 6th landings, 80 days of battle. So all of these situate him as a Canadian. He's uh, Christian. Uh, we've got the sense of regiment. We have his age, but then we have this really personal uh, epitaph at the bottom which I think changes our relationship to this, this forest of symbols, right? We have a bunch of ideas here that are conveying information to us. A beautiful future planned only uh, to end in a dream, dear. My thoughts are ever of you and what might have been. Uh, it's just, you know, it just changes our understanding of who this person is. We don't see him only as a soldier. We see him as a partner to uh, perhaps a, um, a young woman who is now shattered. Her life is shattered. So his death goes far beyond the fields of France. So this is what we call a forest of symbols uh, with a lot of meaning. And um, Gertz talks about the all these kinds of symbols that surround us in our lives that shape us and give us a sense of identity. And he refers to this idea that we we create these symbols and we um, they give us a sense of meaning in our lives. So it says that um, man is an animal suspended in webs of significance he himself has spun. I take culture to be those webs and the analysis of it to be therefore not an experimental science in search of law, but an interpretive one in search of meaning. 
So this is pretty powerful stuff, heavy, heavy material for a, for a Thursday evening. But um, when we're talking about heritage, we're often talking about symbols and we're talking about the meaning we draw from them. And I'll show you what this, uh, how this evolves with some recent events in our lives. So heritage is part of our webs of significance, right? It informs our social identity, our national identity. There, we take individual, certain elements of the past uh, and we use them in the present. It. So, you know, this week where we have Vimy uh, commemorated, celebrated, uh, there are so many other battles in April and May of 1917, but we, we tend to focus only on the Vimy story as one element uh, to represent many aspects of the war. So um, we can't remember everything of history, so we only use certain elements of it in the present. Um, sometimes we view heritage as, you know, this term of safely dead. It's just benign, it's there, we look at it, it has no meaning. But of course we know differently and, and recent events have showed us how uh, history and heritage is not safely dead. Uh, it's powerful, it lives, it gains relevance uh, one day where it sits quietly and then the next day it changes. So, um, and there's some other ideas here about that, you know, heritage allows us to build a relationship between our, uh, between people in time, people in place, people in memory. It can be inspiring, political, controversial, it can trigger, trigger uh, dialogue. Um, about the world around us um, and um, and so it's therefore very important for us to consider it. So when we look at war memorials, we look at sites of memory, I mean they, they go all the way back to the uh, first century AD and probably even earlier than that. This is the famous Ark of Titus in Rome um, and uh, we see the Ark of, of Triumph which is almost an echo of it built in the 19th century to to commemorate and celebrate uh, Napoleonic Wars. Uh, we have um, the Sydney March, sorry, not, Sydney March is in this photo, but the March family here, brothers and the sister who uh, designed the National War Memorial in Ottawa are here. And we've always tried to find symbols um, that represent this past. Uh, that we can use to help us commemorate and remember. You know, and as time has gone on, some of these have become quite radical. This is Maya Lin's uh, famous uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., which was for many people controversial. Other people found it very empowering and powerful because you could touch the wall, you could you could um, touch a name, you could scribe over it and trace it out. Uh, and uh, it has um, drawn people to it ever since it was it was unveiled in the early 80s. But you don't necessarily always have to build a memorial for a place to have strength and power. Sometimes you just have to layer a story over it as I've tried to do earlier in this presentation. And here's a, another place that uh, isn't just any beach. It's, of course, Juneau Beach. We see uh, a young man with his Canadian flag kneeling down. It was June 6th of 2009. And I remember him burying something in the sand. And I just from a distance uh, took a photograph um, and uh, just, to, just to see him engaging in his own personal act of remembrance. Barstable, who wrote a, a book on uh, D-Day, he speaks about the the power of, of these places, the sense of place of the beaches. He says, even now the D-Day beaches have a stillness about them, a solemn air that makes you inclined to tread softly, and keep your voice to a whisper. You go mindly when you mindfully when you explore the landing grounds as if you were in a church, and it is not hard to tell where this sense comes from. It is the sanctity of spilt blood. You can still sense it, though the tides have washed over the beaches 40,000 times since the day of the battle. So this is this is uh, 
I think many of us who have had the the great chance to go to these places would go, yeah, yeah. When I stand on Juneau Beach or even Omaha, even though I'm not American, I, I stand there and I can feel the power of it. Uh, but this is something, of course, that we've constructed. And that's why I want to talk about how we co-construct meaning at these places. You know, we our, our minds are powerful tools and uh, it's not to belittle that. It's not to say that we've been uh, fooled. It's just to say that um, we build symbolism and meaning ourselves uh, when we go to these places. So it stands to reason that we should actually just touch on this, uh, this episode that we're living through right now and the controversy around the condominiums that are being constructed at the Juno Beach Centre. And I was saying earlier about how um, heritage is, uh, is not safely dead. And this is a, a case in point. You know, um, had we been talking about uh, Juno Beach Centre in uh, 2016, 17, we'd be talking about um, the, the new exhibit that would be going in there, you know, its future direction, what it was going to do with its the learning activities for uh, students in Europe, as well as students coming over from Canada and the general public who comes to the centre. And now we're talking about, as Natalie Worthington said on the CBC last night, this will kill Juno Beach Centre the building of this condominium and particularly the traffic that will will uh, basically choke this entrance way. So we have a, you know, in terms of Canadian heritage, we have a, uh, it's a controversy, but it's also a threat to uh, destroying something that is particularly important. Now we might say, well, it's a bunch of condominiums. It's, it's just over here. The Juno Beach Center will be there. It'll, it'll continue. Um, but, uh, these kinds of things uh, warrant us to focus and try to do anything we can to try to preserve these sites. If if we're seeing uh, a lot of people quite concerned about it, I think they they warrant our attention. But closer to home, I just wanted to touch on this one, and I won't go into this in detail. I think we've all had enough of this, this story in one way, although it is quite profound in another. Um, and I show these images um, not to recount this story, but to show the power of a site of memory. And uh, and at first, you know, when we had the, the person standing on the tomb of the unknown soldier, there was outrage, and correctly so. In the, in the weeks that followed, there was an effort by protesters to essentially take back the memorial to show their respect for it. So important is the... Um, war heritage of Canada to everyone, that there was this whole sense of um, trying to uh, take it as their own. So all this is to say is to illustrate the power of these places in the present and how they can be used politically and how uh, people are very emotionally attached to these locations. Here's another example of uh, of a challenge we have these days when we talk about uh, remembrance. These are part of the 10,000 Canadian youth that I was had the pleasure of uh, working with and meeting. Um, and this is the Vimy 100 commemoration. We're gonna come back to this. And I guess my point here is, how do we link with new generations about heritage that is 100 years old, uh, First World War in this case? So um, how do we engage them? How do we make it meaningful so that it uh, changes and, and inspires them to do good things uh, in the world? I see my time's 4.35 and uh, I do have a few more slides. I hope you permit me another uh, 10 minutes or so um, as we go along. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly whistle through a few items here and maybe uh, see if we can um, get to uh, the conclusion that I can take your questions here. I just want to touch on this idea of remembrance so we can get to the remembering well idea. There's a lot of things around how we conduct ourselves at uh, memorial sites and and the Ottawa event uh, is an example of that. So the Teot Val Memorial has a sign, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial has a sign and all of these convey a sense of how to be respectful and mindful when we go to these sites. So um, we'll come back to that whole idea of conduct in a second, but um, there's really two perspectives we can think about if we simplify the whole discussion around remembrance. We have the act of public 
recollection, the collective remembrance, where we come together in ceremony and we do that maybe on November 11th or we do that uh, for certain battles uh, or certain events. And uh, this is uh, June 6th, 2009. Uh, Barack Obama is about to speak at the Omaha uh, uh, Normandy American Cemetery. And uh, so these, these public events involve certain rituals that we're familiar with, uh, hymns, uh, laying of wreath, two minute silence, these kinds of things. And that re repetition allows us to literally, uh, you know, maintain the, the memory as it were. We typically use these events to talk about the nation. Um, we think about the Ottawa Cenotaph and when we have our Remembrance, uh, Remembrance Day uh, ceremony, that is uh, a national ceremony. But of course, when we think about a second perspective, it would be the personal uh, views. And I mentioned my experience with uh, my my Dan, um, my Uncle Dan. There's a uh, Cullis Lancaster, uh, a naval officer with the Canadian Navy with his daughter, and he's sharing with her a photograph he took as he uh, brought ashore uh, soldiers at Omaha Beach. These are um, these are personal experiences, and we may attend a uh, a big ceremony, and we're really alone with our own thoughts, and they can be quite powerful. Uh, but the memory can also die; it can be forgotten, right? So that's that's something to remember when we think about these personal thoughts. How are we doing there, Ken? You all right? Good. OK, is there a right or wrong way to remember? Well, you know, I put this photograph in here to, you know, evoke that question, because sometimes when we look at reenactors, we go, well, this is not very good. This is disrespectful. But then if we actually go up and talk to them, as I had the pleasure of doing, I find out that they're wearing the Lincoln and Welland uniform. Well, at least this fellow is. Um, because uh, the, um, the Lincoln Welland Regiment um, liberated his town. And uh, he comes to Normandy every year wearing the Canadian uniform uh, to uh, celebrate and commemorate uh, the liberators. So, you know, it's not always so easy to figure out what's good remembrance and bad remembrance. Sometimes we can spot it, though. Uh, we think of commodification. We can think of efforts to brand remembrance. This is a famous tweet from many years ago when AT&T tried to, you know, uh, advertise their new phone at the same time as um, trying to uh, commemorate 9-11. So these things can cause fury, you know, just as the Ottawa uh, events did. Um, you know, people are very um, protective of memory. We're also concerned about glorification of war. We're concerned about what we call heritage dissonance, where we you know, particularly when you go to Normandy and you see people that are camping and they're they're playing uh, on a beach or something, and people get upset about these kinds of um, contrasts in behavior and conduct that uh, maybe a, perhaps a different approach should be taken. And these are never easy discussions to get through. I'm going to pass on the Johnson poem because I think we're limited in our time, but I'll just I'll just show it to. The famous Highwood poem um, by um, a veteran of the First World War, and he draws this wonderful image of wonderful, uh, a powerful image, shall I say, of tourists going to a battlefield that's owned by um, by a tour company, and he advises people um, that they are to keep to the path, and that uh, the company keeps absolutely untouched. And in the dugout, genuine, we provide refreshments at a reasonable rate. You're requested not to leave uh, about paper or ginger beer bottles or orange peel. There are waste paper baskets at the gate. And, and what he's talking about is a particular uh, place in uh, the Battle of the Somme called Highwood. And uh, his concern, Johnson's concern is that in the years to come, that it would just be a tourist attraction, that people would just treat it uh, with such a, dismiss, uh, such a dismissive attitude, that they would not care, that it would just be for profit. Well, this is what Highwood looks like today. 
Highwood is not a battle that we know very much of, unless we're Scottish. For, for the Scots and the regiments that were involved, it was, uh, it was quite a horrific uh, battle. But this is an example where uh, when we don't have any um, effort to remember it, it can quickly be forgotten or silenced. So these are some of the challenges that we face. This is another example of a memorial that is essentially hidden in plain sight. It's in London uh, and, uh, you know, they keep uh, various pieces of trash beside it. This is a challenge we see all over the world, really. Uh, here's um, another site for the, uh, the um, Regina rifles. It's, um, there's, the, there's the memorial plaque. It's by an industrial park. They built the industrial park and basically that's where the memorial now rests. So these things become big issues and then there's always uh, someone local often who is the guardian of remembrance who tries to protect these stories. There's some places that do this quite well. I'm just watching my time and just going to pass through some of these, these little stories I had. But I often, you know, I take students to Munich uh, and uh, I was fascinated with this particular place, Leopold Square. And um, of course, it has a very dark history. This is where a lot of rituals took place that um, reflect on the Munich Putsch of 1923. Uh, here's the um, proclamation to Hitler going on with uh, various, you can see SS soldiers who are making their, um, their oath to Hitler. And just beside it, Leopold Square, this is where the uh, where the putsch is memorialized and people had to salute it as they went by. So people would often dodge it and go around it. This is called Shirker's Alley. So the uh, people of Munich had these stones put through here to show the route that people would take to avoid uh, facing the truth. Very powerful. But this that photo back here is actually of um, a library. And this is uh, a mobile library that gets set up here. They have like a little cafe. People get to sit there, read, learn, have, you know, kids are playing and it just changes. Um, it changes the story here. People are very much aware of this place. And so doing something that almost counters it is a powerful example of remembering well, I think. So let's just do a quick definition of remembering well. It's about uh, trying to achieve a greater good from collective remembrance. There are two elements really to remembering well. One is a quantitative element and the other one is a qualitative. So when we talk about quantitative aspect of remembering well, it's about the number of commemorative events and the level of participation. It's, you know, it's important to build access, momentum, maintain profile, relevance. These are often used as our measure of success. How many people watched a film? How many people went to the ceremony? 25,000. Well, that's pretty good. And that's 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 a good measure. But of course, we also want to understand what's happened within it, what meaning people have drawn from it. So this is where we can actually talk about level engagement, meaning, thinking about how we use remembrance to deepen and broaden learning and thinking. All right, so uh, I think this this is where it's really important. If, for example, Canadians are in agreement about the importance of war heritage, and yet we disagree on other things, like we saw in Ottawa, perhaps there's a way to use war remembrance uh, as a bridge to find better understanding and, and, a, and a common ground. How do we enable remembering well? Well, a few things we could do. We could see something, realize that remembrance is something we co-construct. We have to design things for the people that are attending. Um, we have to realize that we're, when we talk about remembrance, we're actually teaching, learning, and storytelling. We're not remembering something we witnessed and experienced. We're telling people about something that happened uh, generations previously and trying to find meaning in it. Tangible things like sites of memory and objects provide a gateway um, to the emotion of history. And I think emotion is an important thing. It's not to over sentimentalize 
these things, but it is a chance for us to find a way that triggers a connection for us. Emphasizing elements of the story that link with the audience, things change as we're well aware over time. And sometimes elements of a story that were always secondary all of a sudden become primary to the telling of a story. We also need to draw on uh, more than just history. History, of course, is critical, but we need to look to other academic disciplines to help us build good practice. And pedagogy is part of that. We also need to preserve sites of memory preserve artifacts, recognize their value. And uh, so this is something that's important for us. Um, I was going to show you a little bit about the Vimy Expo that I was involved with. Um, I just wanted to go take us back to Vimy. I'm watching my time here. I want to be very careful here. Um, but um, what should I do, Ken? Should I just wrap it up? No, nope, go, keep going. OK, great. So I'll take you back to this photograph of uh, gang of uh, 10,000. We're all being bussed up to Vimy on uh, April 9th of 2017. And um, I'm not sure if many of you were there, if you had a chance. Uh, so the task that I was uh, recruited into, so you can see the there's an, a logo on all of these red jackets. Education First Tours essentially organized this. They're a Swiss-based company. Um, so schools raised money for students to go over. There was no federal government money to, you know, compensate or support students from going overseas. So, you know, we may also have concerns about who had the, who had the, who was entitled enough to go. Um, but um, nevertheless, 10,000 students are there. It's a very powerful scene. It was a very hot day. It was a hard day. It was a, a long day. And uh, by the time the commemoration started, it was, you know, people were sitting down and, uh, you know, Food was an issue, water was an issue. And uh, what I was involved with was the next day. And we were given this challenge. What should we do with 10,000 Canadian students commemorating the Battle of Vimy Ridge um, on April 10th? This was the space we had. So the idea was to create some kind of um, educational experience where students could walk through and engage with um, the past, the present, and the future, but within the context of the Vimy experience. So I was one of several academics from across the country that was involved. University of Toronto, was uh, their education department was heavily involved. Um, and uh, so this is a, a one shot of this expo. And I wanted to just share with you a, a short video of um, what happened that particular day with the Vimy project. You can see what the expo, what happened at the expo. It's just three minutes. A century ago, as dawn broke over Vimy Ridge, the morning air suddenly exploded with an unholy roar. It was the sound of 15,000 Canadians surging into battle. Today, 100 years later, we honor their eternal sacrifice. The events of that day saw the four divisions of the Canadian Corps serving together for the first time to take a stand against tyranny and oppression. This was Canada at its best. The Canadians of Vimy embodied the true North, strong and free. Today there are no remaining veterans of the First World War. That means it's up to us to remember and to honor their memory, lest we forget. This trip has been very important to sort of remind both myself and other people, you know, just what it is to be Canadian. It's it strengthened my my 
pride in my country and in my nationality as being Canadian. Um, I definitely am more aware and I am more appreciative of what has happened in history. It, it suddenly becomes something that we're grateful for and a piece of history that we take pride in. You're seeing it through a different lens, right? You're seeing the ripple effect through the generations. Your worldview is challenged and it just affects you as a person. Like you can't look at this and come back unchanged. 100 years later, as I look over the faces gathered here, I can't help but feel that a torch is being passed. Let us hold to the grace of the ones who stood by their country. This is why we're here, why we remember. So, um, just a quick shot. There's a various um, uh, films about uh, the EF Tours effort at the Vimy Expo. Uh, and as I mentioned, it, the past, present, future themes took us to a place where we we're talking about um, uh, everything about uh, how you would design a memorial today to how do you address world peace? You know, what is it, what actions can be taken to support uh, people with disabilities, and there was a, there was a, in this section there with Invictus Games, uh, all kinds of different uh, themes that were, uh, you know, brought out and uh, students could interact with. So quite a powerful place. Um, I'll just conclude here with a, a few things that uh, when we think about war heritage, it, it, there's all different elements that we can focus on. In addition to work overseas, I think there's a lot that can be said about what we have here in Canada. And so what I've tried to do is focus on sites of memory that we have here in Canada. There's about 30 films on the site, can be used by students, teachers, general public. And I, I encourage you to go to the site. I'll have the link at the very end here. Uh, so here's a few examples. Chinese Labour Corps, William Head Institution, Machosin, just outside of Victoria, where uh, upwards of um, 60,000 uh, Chinese Labour Corps passed through on their way to the Western Front. Uh, they were quarantined here, put on trains, locked in trains, taken across the country, ships to the far side um, out of Halifax and then on to, uh, on to Europe. So that's a powerful story. We have other ones like the Bar U Ranch, a National Historic Site in Alberta, um, where Percheron horses were, um, were reared and sent over to the front. Um, another uh, different perspective when we think about war heritage, a uh, place like uh, Riding Mat uh, Mountain National Park in Manitoba. That's um, actually a former prison of war camp. Quite a quite an intriguing story there. Another film that you can watch. Uh, recently completed one on um, a ship called Athabascan, and we had an event at the uh, university where we brought in um, family members to attend. And this story links the university with a local school and a site in Brittany. Uh, so all of these stories are quite powerful stories and uh, always require a little bit of uh, support. Uh, and so if uh, one thing I'd like to say is our ways of we remember war is a project that is, as I mentioned, in its final stage. Uh, so if there's anyone out there that's willing to donate, be very supportive of that. Um, Trees of Remembrance, we had this on local television, a uh, very powerful story inspired by a fellow by the name of Ray Travers. And um, uh, that was a quite a well-received film locally. Final couple slides on Vimy. When I was a guide, um, these, are the, these are the markers that I always thought were most profound. Uh, this is uh, Breaking of the Sword. This is on the far side of the memorial. There's so many powerful allegorical figures here. Uh, and when you think about it, it was designed in the early 1920s and then was unveiled by 36. 
um, from that trajectory of the early 20s of thinking that we'll never do that again to 36, you know, the storm clouds of war were on the horizon. Um, this one is also very powerful, very unique for war memorials of the, the First World War, and I would say even for the Second World War, um, this is uh, sympathy for the vi victims. Canada's sympathy for the victims. So civilians, refugees, um, that's, a, that's a powerful story that's on this monument that we revere. And I would also say now's a good time to remember the allegorical figures up high, which are to represent the virtues of Canada and France. And this was what Allward said of them. They're the figures of truth, faith, justice, charity, knowledge, and peace. Sing the hymn of peace. So it would be on this note that I'd like to uh, conclude tonight and to think that when we think of war heritage and we think of the opportunity there is to remember well, it is to have us think about and engage with ideas such as this and how these can be part of our world today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. That was really enlightening and really gave you a lot to, me a lot to think about and uh, really, really great talk. And you've been around to a lot of uh, amazing sites of Canadian remembrance. Um, so I do have uh, some questions to um, to test you on, I guess. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, one is, um, can you speak to the inequities in remembrance as a result of anti-Indigenous and anti-Black racism and how this can be addressed so mm. we are truly remembering well? Yes, that's a that's a powerful one. Um, and I'm meeting with uh, Chief David Mungo Knox tomorrow, who's a descendant of Mungo Martin, who is a carver here in uh, Vancouver Island, uh, Kwakutl, um Kwakwak Nation from the northern end of the island. Um, and we are doing a piece on a Indigenous Veterans uh, War Memorial here in Victoria. We're doing a film on that. Um, so I'll provide technical support to uh, Chief David. Um, and I think it's those kinds of things. It's, it's about part of reconciliation, I think, is about trying to understand uh, the uh, inequalities that occurred after the Second World War. Not, you know, and it, it's this, I, I did a piece with um, uh, the Métis and the focus that they wanted to speak to was war was the great equalizer that, you know, when you when when indigenous uh, people went off to war, they wore the uniform, they were treated as equals. And then when they came home, they were no longer treated as equals. And so that, that's there's many powerful stories that need to be told. And I think for other groups as well in the films that I've done, spoke to the Japanese Canadian uh, internment, the Ukrainian internment in the First World War, um, conscientious objectors. Of course, there's there's um, uh, all of these stories need to be told. They and they need to be told. I think in ways that people can access. And I think that's why things like film is a good uh, way to do this. We can't always travel, as COVID has taught us, but also financially. People can always make it over to Europe or go to Halifax to see some of the wonderful exhibits there about the the um, the African Canadians that were involved uh, that came out of mostly uh, out of the Maritimes. There was a big group that went and formed up um, uh, a battalion. Uh, and I remember seeing the exhibit when I was at the Citadel in Halifax. So uh, film is a great way, short film, I think, because then it's, it's accessible to people. So I think that's one of the things as, you know, people that are interested in teaching and, and uh, be it academics uh, or teachers uh, in the classroom, researchers, is to find ways to create uh, knowledge that's accessible. And um, I think that's one of the things we need to think about. It's a big topic, definitely, yeah. but uh, I liked I like that that, that questions come up, and I, I always remember uh, when I when I met a uh, uh, a woman who was um, Japanese Canadian internee, and I said I, I'd like to do a film with you about Japanese internment, and she said no no it's Japanese Canadian, 
And I realized I had a lot to learn. I had a lot to learn from, you know, uh, from uh, Marie Kadagawa and her story. And there's so many stories out there that we can uh, we can explore. And we don't have to go very far to do that. Yeah, I have a feeling that you're ne never not learning. Like it's always right. a new experience and there's always something else to take in. Um, yeah, th th thank you for answering yeah. that. There is a there is another one I should mention, and um, you know the, the when we talk about remembrance, of course the the what we're trying and I tried to point this out is there's all these different challenges to remembrance, politics of remembrance, and you know the silencing of of stories. And uh, if you go to moralawakening.ca, is a piece that I did with the Dene up in Great Bear Lake and their involvement with the uh, Manhattan Project, a very um, very tragic story, uh, and sometimes we we shy away from those stories that are tragic. But it's really worth one that um, it, it's really worth watching. I think called moralawakening.ca. So, um, another question: um, Do you think the remembrance has changed since you worked at Vimy uh, so many years ago? Is a change between now and then? Yeah, well, I, there's definitely some changes in terms of how it's been organized. Um, and it, you can kind of think, you know, back in 1990, uh, and for those of you that know uh, the uh, Vimy, a critical assessment book that came out in, uh, I'm not sure when that was, I'm sure maybe people who were on uh, the audience uh, would know that book. But so there I am, I am in 1990 as a guide. And we're telling people about the pine trees and the maple trees and how each tree represents a soldier with no known grave and that there's 11,285 trees in the park, right? Even to this day, I could remember that whole phrase because it was it was powerful. People were like, wow, you know, and you could say, imagine, you know, let's imagine all these people as the men that that died in France in, in the First World War who have no known grave. And that those are the names that are on the Vimy Memorial. Well, of course, that's not true. <laughs> There's no connection between the number of trees in the park and that. But it, somehow that that myth had grown, it was part of our our notes that were given to us. And we were to we were to follow those notes. And um, so there the Vimy critical assessment, one of the one of the um, chapters I remember reading basically said, no, that story is not true. And uh, so there was. At that time, we were working with the Pierre Burton book, Vimy, which is a piece of popular history. It has its merits. It also has its challenges. But we were very much focused on a, a heroic notion of what Vimy was about. Like, we could tell you everything about uh, the Canadian story, I felt. But if you, um, if someone said, as, as one day a, a group of German veterans showed up and they were following their route, their... 50th anniversary route uh, because it was 1990 so 1940 was the invasion of uh, France and they said so tell us about the German side we had no clue we had no clue of the German side back then since then Parks Canada I think has taken a, a large role in creating a, a stronger interpretive program I think this is the thing is storytelling is an art and uh, you need to find ways to have meaningful interpretation and um, it, it's not just about facts and figures. And so uh, Parks Canada is uh, is our expert in that in that way. And um, I think they do I think they do well at it. Um, so that's what I would say is change from a structural perspective. I think we have uh, I think one thing that I on a negative side, I would say is that over time there's more and more focus on solely on Vimy. So if you are to uh, turn your direction away from Vimy and go to the east towards Cambrai, so Arras to Cambrai is, of course, the area where in 1918, the 100 Days uh, attack, uh, 100 Days campaign took place. 60,000 Canadians killed or wounded in the last 100 days of the war. And uh, rarely do we really tour that area. So one of the challenges with Vimy is that it 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 can um, it can close us down from other other narratives, 
And I think we also need to be able to break free of our own national narrative and that we need to be aware of um, other nations that were involved. You know, um, you know, I was, I was, you know, Indian troops, um, Algerian troops, uh, you know, all these different stories that are out there that we tend to set aside to focus on our own national story, um, which is important, but yet we also can learn a lot from the experience of the Irish troops, for example. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, about the, the condo development in um, near the Juneau Beach, do you think it's being pushed through by because the French are a little bit dismissive of the Canadian contribution or are they just ignorant of the Canadian contribution? Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, if we were to think cynically about this, uh, and it's hard not to at times because, you know, over the history of the past 15 years, there was the mythic beaches controversy where there was a branding effort that occurred which focused on promoting the mythic beaches of D-Day. And they had kind of hived off an area which didn't include Juneau and uh, all the points to the uh, east of Juneau. So that that was highly controversial and uh, didn't go anywhere. And it was basically lined up with regional council uh, borders. So um, so there was this effort where we, you know, as Canadians, we maybe felt, well, we're getting forgotten here. You know, it's about the Americans. It's about Band of Brothers saving Private Ryan. Another story was um, the windmills off the coast, and uh, they were going to be placed uh, off Juneau. And the view was, well, you never, you'll never put them off Omaha because the Americans would freak out. But you're willing to put them off Juneau. So this is kind of one of these things that we tend to have to do to f to fight in a way to make our voices heard. There's a lot of support in Normandy for Canadians and other parts of uh, France. I, I don't doubt that the experiences I've had there, it's quite profound. There's people that do realize what, what Canada's done, but there's also the march of development, you know, and there's areas in the Eep salient which have been turned into industrial parks. And some people say, yeah, well, we can't protect all of it. We can't protect every battlefield. And this is where heritage steps in and says, well, we need to focus on protecting these elements of it. So I would say that the um, there's many French supporters of the Canada, the Canadian story. I don't think we should ever doubt that. Um, but uh, I think there are also forces of any nationality that basically say, you know what, it's time to move on. We're creating homes for people. Um, so it's a heavy controversy and I hope it gets uh, I hope it gets resolved to the benefit of uh, Juno Beach Center because they do some excellent work. Yeah, it's a, it's a fabulous site. Um, do you think um, the remembering is different between Canadians and Americans? Do you think there's a difference mm. between how we remember? Yeah, that's interesting because like if you think about the rituals and the ways we engage with uh, and commemorate, you know, the actual act of remembrance and what's said, there's a lot of similarities. Um, the meaning that people draw differs. And I'll tell you a couple of anecdotes. Uh, so there used to be a narrative, an interpretation when you went to uh, Pearl Harbor which was run by the US Park Service, say back in the 60s, where they would say, uh, you know, they would tell the story of the, of the attack on Pearl Harbor and they would conclude by saying, and the moral of the story is, be prepared, right? Have a strong military. And everyone, you know, that was, that resonated. And then the American, uh, the US Park Service stepped away from that. And they said, look, let's not use it as a, as a moral, uh, uh, political position. Let's just tell the story of what happened and not conclude as to what direction needs to be taken. And that was very controversial. Um, so what I found is that when people make meaning of a place like the Normandy American Cemetery, you'll have some people that will say, this is why we need a strong uh, military, you know, typically an American. And another American might say, you know what? We've fallen from grace from where we once were. 
uh, we we um, are not the international leader of democracy that we once were. So you see two different interpretations kind of drawn along a Republican and Democratic line that um, kind of shape how people interpret our, the past. So, you know, um, there are differences. There's also some similarities. Uh, you know, there's a fascinating book called The Boys of Point de Hoc, which is about Ronald Reagan's speech in 1984 and how it was used as a pivot point about American foreign policy coming out of the shadow of the Vietnam War. Uh, and it was uh, such a seminal speech. And over the decades, other presidents have used uh, the Normandy American Cemetery in particular as an important site for, for a speech that was a, had a foreign policy reach. Clinton did that, uh, Obama to a certain extent. Um, so uh, they use, the American Battle Monuments Commission focuses on promoting Americans to go overseas to visit their sites. They're actively, um, they actively do that. So their relationship with war remembrance is complicated and uh, different than ours. They spent $40 million on their interpretive center uh, at the Normandy American Cemetery, we spent about four million through, you know, thanks to Walmart and some other, you know, dedicated citizens who bought a brick towards the Juno Beach Center. So that's a huge difference. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's do one more question, and um, this one's sort of personal. What is your most emotional or meaningful experience you've had in your uh, research or your work? Hmm. I'm sure there's lots to think about. Yeah, yeah, there are lots. There are lots. I would say, I would say, like, you know, the the I'm an anthropologist by training, so the idea of of uh, experiencing things for myself allows me that reflexive opportunity to engage in those kinds of um, feel thoughts and feelings. So I would say two come to mind. One is uh, Brittany. Um, I was there to film. It's it's on the website. It's called Remembering uh, Athabascan, HMCS Athabascan, ship that was sunk off the coast of Brittany. Uh, about 110, 20 Canadians uh, lost their lives. Haida was famously involved with saving um, the lives of some of the Canadians in the water. Of course, Haida's alongside in uh, Hamilton, beautiful, uh, you know, site for it to, you know, allow people to access the ship and its story. So I, we showed up, we had the film crew, we got our, our hiking shoes on, we're ready to, you know, go everywhere and anywhere to film, and we're meeting up with some people at the city hall. We go into the small community of uh, Brignogan, and there's the mayor, Sash on, and, you know, it's like on behalf of the people of France, you know, what, what, you know, welcome kind of thing. And it was a very formal ceremony. And um, there's some, it's funny in a way because we were completely unprepared for that. You know, going back to the whole thing about the French and their willingness or support of us. This was it. This was playing out before me was their support of, you know, the Canadian sacrifice. So... Um, that was powerful, and particularly as a naval officer, um, and the connections it has to Victoria, that story is powerful. The other one was um, the pilgrimage of 2015 to Kitchener's Wood with the Calgary Highlanders, uh, and the Canadian Scottish were there as well. Um, that was quite profound too, because there we were on the anniversary of the Battle of Kitchener's Wood, 22nd of April, 1915, was the first Canadian um, major battle of the First World War. And it was the gas attack had occurred that day. And the Canadians were brought up, you know, imagine first first battle and they're marching into the darkness, no reconnaissance. It's 1130 at night and they're crossing a field to try to hold the salient line, which has been essentially destroyed by the gas attack and the Germans could easily march right into Ypres. So the the Canadians hurled themselves into this this hole in the line, and there we are, a hundred years later, um, dining with uh, Belgians on the battlefield itself, and it was um, it was powerful, powerful experience. 
And, I, you know, it was um, also a chance to, um, you know, trigger me to do this film about ways we remember war. Because I could see the way the military was thinking about this thing and civilians, there was lots of commonalities and there was lots of differences. I was talking to Canadians who were uh, veterans of Afghanistan and what they were thinking about it and very, very powerful uh, experience in the middle of the night, yet a story that many of us don't know, right? And I think this is the power of uh, war remembrance is, is the fact that um, we can explore these stories and they take us in all kinds of different places. Um, I've since come back from Alberta where I was visiting the gravesite of Albert Mountain Horse, one of the first indigenous soldiers to be wounded in the in, uh, just the day later. Um, and he's uh, buried in Canada. Uh, gassed, got home, died. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's, his story is in southern Alberta. So, like, there's all these different threads that take us all over the place. So those would be two of many. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure you could write a book on all the ones you yeah. have. There's been a lot of experiences. Well, uh, thank you again, Jeff. This was really fascinating. And um, yeah, there's so much more research that I want to do now and, and look into all of the things that you've done. So um, thanks again. It was, it was fascinating. Um, just want to let people know that this is our last lecture this spring. Uh, we will return in September and hopefully we'll have the lectures in person. It's been wonderful doing them um, virtually because we've been able to have people like Jeff uh, on one coast. We had Craig Smith in Halifax uh, earlier in, in October, so we were able to reach both coasts with our, our speakers this year. So it was amazing to do that. Uh, this year is the 150th anniversary of John McRae's birth. So we are commemorating in a few ways. We have a, a memorial tour going on in August. Uh, 19th to, to 29th, that's going to France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. So mm -hmm. you can check out more of that on our, our website. Um, we also are hosting a uh, one day uh, John McRae symposium on November 25th. His birthday is actually on the, the 28th of November. Um, so, but uh, we are doing a symposium on John and having some um, speakers come in. And so it'll be in person and virtual uh, a day. Uh, but I'm looking forward to that. Um, and the museum, Guelph museums are open to the public. No appointments necessary. We have some new exhibits up and on display that uh, we'd love to have you come in and check out. And you, I'm sure you'd love to, to see them and get a chance to come out and visit the museum again. Uh, and also uh, on Friday, April 22nd, we have the On Dine Quartet performing on our fourth Friday at seven o'clock. So um, you can get free tickets for that and join us for that. That is an in-person event. Um, so I want to thank everyone again for joining us uh, this year and for the great questions. And uh, we've had some great speakers and great topics this year. Uh, and if you have any ideas for topics for next year, let me know. Um, so have a great summer, a happy Easter, and I look forward to seeing you in September um, and joining us again for our military lecture series. Thanks again for coming. And thanks again, Jeff. Wonderful talk tonight. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Write to me if you'd like to chat more. <laughs>